What does it mean to lead a legacy? How do you focus on your future when you have so many things you need to focus on now? Or when your past is swallowing you whole? Are you leading a path that you want or is it a path that your parents want? Do you find yourself competing with the journey of others, like your friends and your peers, that, that they're taking? According to Marie Kondo, the space in which we live should be for the person we are becoming now and not the person we were in the past. Although she's speaking in relation to our living space, I think it can apply in all aspects of our lives. Hi, my name is Brandi Lewis. I am 28 years old and I live in Los Angeles, California. When I think about my goals and the path of my life that I wanted for myself in middle school and in high school, three things stick out the most. One, I wanted to dance. Whatever I decided to do in life, I made, wanted to make sure that dance would always be my number one passion and somehow or some way I would be dancing for a living. Two, my end goal was to achieve financial stability. If that meant having another career that could help pay for the bills and pay for my passion, then so be it. I wanted to help people, whether that meant mentorship, philanthropy, starting my own nonprofit, or even simple gestures in my daily life. So what do I do now? Well, I work in media and advertising. I negotiate and build national TV ad campaigns for multiple clients in the commercials that you see on TV. I also write for a blog and advocate and raise awareness for multiple human rights and health issues. I use my voice to help others navigate through their difficult circumstances in life and encouraging those to continue and always celebrate the little victories every step of the way. I personally haven't danced in over two years, but it's not due to my loss of my passion, but due to circumstances that are out of my control. So how did I get here? Let's go back to the beginning and walk through this roller coaster together. As a child, I loved music. I loved the arts and most importantly, I loved the way it made me feel. Unfortunately, rhythm was something that skipped a generation because for the life of me, I could not catch a beat. My family loves to bring up the time where I was in the church choir in the front, biggest smile on my face, singing and clapping and rocking off beat clashing into everyone beside me. My mother instilled a love for the arts and knowledge early on. We went to museums, community showcases. She really wanted to expand our worldview beyond the four corners of our block on the south side of Chicago. I was infatuated with Alvin Ailey Dance Company. I had the books. I went to their shows when they came into town, and I loved watching ballerinas soar through the sky. I wanted that to be me. I was deeply in love with dance. However, the painful truth was I was an absolutely terrible dancer. When I danced, it was like a mix of Dua Lipa and Bambi. Not a good combo. Um, I remember seeing the music videos of Justin Timberlake and Aaliyah and trying to learn their choreography. I wasn't enrolled in any dance classes because that wasn't something that I had access to. I was really, really bad at dancing, but I kept dancing. By the time I moved to the Northwest suburbs, I had a better sense of what rhythm was and started to clap on beat. I joined Spirit Squad in middle school and chorus and I danced more and more and more. I remember a good friend of mine told me about a theater dance program called Orcasis and how she would be auditioning when we went to high school. Her sister was on it and she suggested that I try out but I hadn't taken any prof professional lessons before. I was confident on the outside, but on the inside, my insecurities were running rampant. So I chickened out and tried out for palms instead. Although it was not my cup of tea, thankfully it was the right choice because palms gave me the basic technique and foundation that I needed. So my sophomore year, I tried out for orcasis. Every step, every pirouette, felt like the movement just belonged in my body and the songs they they wept off my off my limbs and I soared like I always wanted to. I danced down orchestras for the rest of my high school career. I started taking ballet classes through orchestras but I also attended Faubourg Ballet Academy 
So being up at 6 a.m. for ballet, getting home at 10 p.m. after long rehearsals and night classes at Faubourg, they were not easy, but I did the work. I trained so hard because if I wanted to dance for Ailey, I had a lot to learn. Since I never had technical training at, at the academy, I was taking ballet classes with 12 year, old, 12 year olds. It's a humbling experience, but it's what you need to do. I had a desire to not only be a professional dancer, but also to continue excel academically. I choreographed multiple pieces on our showcases and submitted at state, and, uh, as well as our District 214 assemblies. By my senior year, I was in independent study for Japanese. I had to drop AP art in order so I could take college accounting. I was nominated best dancer of my senior class. And in the yearbook for future job, it read accountant and professional, professional dancer. I graduated and should have been off to college. I initially was supposed to go to NIU because my best friend at the time was going. So I felt I should go too and we could be roommates. But to be honest, I wasn't sold on the school or the program, and I decided last minute to stay home and go to Harper Community College for over one year. That summer, I did a summer dance intensive at Deeply Rooted Dance Company in downtown Chicago, and that is where my mindset and life changed, and everything comes full circle. That summer, my body was put through a lot of discipline and stress through commuting to the city, 12 hours of dancing a day, and conditioning five days a week it was difficult, but it was amazing. During class where everyone was exhausted and honestly, we were over it, the instructor gave us a lesson that summed up to, if you want it to succeed and you want success, all you need are three things, patience, commitment, consistency, that's it. Granted, we were talking about dance and technique, but I applied it, applied it to all aspects of life moving forward. Heavily using those three words had got me to where I am today. That summer, I saw a PBS special about the University of Iowa Dance Program, which I ended up attending and being accepted into their program. This seems, things seemed like they were finally, finally falling into place and that I was on my way to my dreams and everything changed February 7th, 2012. I had a really bad migraine to the point where I couldn't, I couldn't see, I couldn't walk on my own without assistance from somebody else. My friend took me to the university hospital and they sent me to the ER. They said they thought I had meningitis and the only way to test for it was by doing a spinal tap or a lumbar puncture. They're the same thing. Which is basically they place a needle in between your vertebrae and then they collect the spinal flu fluid. The first attempt caused me to pass out and fall over the table. And after I came to, they tried again with me lying on my side. Unfortunately, I felt two zaps down the right side of my body. I winced in pain and informed the doctor that I believe he hit a nerve and he told me to relax and I was just anxious. The fluid dripped out slowly and once the re results were back, they said I didn't have meningitis and I was free to go. I was not giving proper post-procedural care instruction and I was told it was just a headache and gave me some medication. Things began to spiral from there. Since I wasn't informed that I should have laid flat for 24 hours, I went to school the next day. I sat out of dance classes so that I would not be marked absent. I was in excruciating back pain. I was nauseous, my head was killing me, my gait was off, and it progressively got worse as the days went on. So I got on a mega bus and I came home and my mom took me to the hospital. My only concern when, was when the pain and weakness was stopped so I could dance again. The doctors didn't have an answer. They gave me some meds and told me not to worry about the spinal damage because typically when you feel this, you will feel the side effects from the sight point down. And I was affected on both my upper extremities and my lower ones as well, but only on the right side. I couldn't, I couldn't dance because so since I couldn't dance, I couldn't be a dance major. And so I had to drop out and do a medical withdrawal. I cried a lot. <laughs> I packed my dorm up with the help of some friends and I moved back home. I went to physical therapy three times a week because the goal was to get my strength back, heal, go to summer school at Harper, 
and finish up prerequisites so then in the fall I could return to Iowa and to dance again. Unfortunately, that did not happen because later in May that year, I was sitting in my nutrition class and I got pain in my right arm and the vision went black in one eye and I slid down the nurse's station. The ambulance was called and I was given the simple test if I would, to see if I was having a stroke. Smile, hold both arms out, and talk. When the paramedic let go of my arm, my right arm fell down immediately. She's too young to be having a stroke, they said. They rushed me to the hospital like an episode of Grey's Anatomy. It, a lot of it was a blur, but I remember them sticking electrodes everywhere. I remember the pain, and I remember crying out for my mom. I had just celebrated my golden birthday. I had jumped on the trampoline. I was so determined to go back and finish my degree and dance again. Now, here I was, laying in a hospital bed, paralyzed from the neck down on the right side of my body. Once I was transferred from the ER to the neuro floor, I didn't cry once. I had patience, commitment, and consistency written on the whiteboards. I was always smiling, and any time they asked if I had any questions, the, question, the answer was always the same. Do you think I'll be able to dance again? I left the nitty-gritty questions of what was going on to my mom. She was a nurse, so I let her advocate. They threw around a lot of possible diagnoses, words, medications, but ultimately they had no idea what was wrong with me. I was transferred, transferred to a rehabilitation facility and that is when everything sank, sank in because I was the youngest resident, second to the youngest resident. The second young, youngest resident was 56. I had one -on -one, I had a one-on-one -on -one evaluation with my physical therapist in the rec room. I was wheeled up to the parallel bars. My heart fluttered, my hands touched them and the memories of hours dancing at the bar and the time that I felt most free came flushing through. She said, we'll take it easy, only try to stand up and we'll try to take a step after, but I have you. I laughed and said, I used to dance for 12 hours a day. I know what my body is capable of. She helped me stand up by pulling on the gate belt around my waist. I tried to concentrate to move my right leg, but it wouldn't budge. As if my legs were a mountain and they suddenly become one with the floor, she eventually used her hand to pick up my foot and move it forward. I burst into tears. It was the ultimate betrayal by my body. Walking and riding again seemed light years away and dancing seemed nearly impossible. But they said that I was young, so I would bounce back quickly. So I turned to patience, commitment, and consistency yet again. I stopped focusing on dancing only again and, and instead, I focused on the small achievable goals and accomplishments that seemed attainable. For example, being able to sit up in bed without assistance, being able to unclench my fist, moving my finger. I celebrated every little victory I made along the way. And after a while, I realized I accomplished so much and walking didn't seem so far away. I did my exercises in my room when my friends came to visit. I was determined and consistent and I will never forget the day I took my first step. I was on a treadmill hooked up to a harness that pulls you up and makes it easier for you to learn how to walk. Titanium by Sia was playing in the background and everyone was watching. I took a step with my left leg and I tried to lift my right foot forward. I dragged it, but it moved. I wasn't, it was not perfect at, by any means, but I did it. And I cried this time tears of relief and joy because all of that hard work paid off. That mountain that was once my legs was now all these small and little victories stacked up one another. To this day, I have a list, actually right there, that reads Brandy's goals for Wednesday. One, walk 100 feet. Two, go up and down just four stairs. Three, kick your right leg out while sitting. This reminds me of how far I've come and whatever happens when you have patience, commitment, and consistency. Now, I would love to say that this is where it ends, but unfortunately, the, the roller coaster continues. After being released and transferred into home therapy and eventually outpatient, things began to turn around. I went to Harper, I got my associate's degree, 
and I was transferring to ISU with the hopes of becoming a high school teacher. It felt like once again I was getting back on track. I was able to gain my strength and mobility back for the most part and ultimately was dancing again, which always ended with my legs giving out and needing several days to recoup. But behind the scenes, I had to change my major, major again. I developed more and more symptoms which hindered my quality of life and ability to function, ultimately resulting in more doctor's appointments, more medication, more relapses, and still no concrete diagnosis, more years of medical racial discrimination, and still no real answers to what the heck was going on. <laughs> there I was leaving school again due to another medical withdrawal. In 2015, my family moved to Arizona. My mom hoped that maybe we'd be able to get me to the Mayo Clinic and get some real answers. answers. Uh, lupus and multiple sclerosis runs in my family. It means that it, it seemed to us as if MS was a culprit. Though I never made it to Mayo, I moved to LA April of that year with the thought of if I do have MS, I want to live life now while I can since I've seen the disease firsthand with family members. Over the next three years, it was a continuous cycle of a few good months and then a relapse. I knew what my triggers were. And if my spine was hurting, it was probably inflamed again, and I just took some naproxen. I knew that certain activities would cause me to be out of commission for a few weeks or even a few, a few days or even a few weeks. Everything had to be calculated. In June 2018, I got a cold that I could not shake. And my spine was hurting to the point where I could not move my neck at all. From June to December of 2018, I had about seven hospital visits and stays. At the time, my doctors believed I had an infection in my spine and the process from 2012 started all over again. I had to get yet another spinal tap. This procedure, we didn't have any mishaps and again, no infection. I spent a few days in the hospital. The pain and the weakness was the same and had the same remnants of before. This time, I had to go on bed rest for three weeks, and I, when I returned, I was put on part-time disability until I collapsed on, in the office and then was sent to another rehab facility. Learning to functionally walk again for the second time, the words patient commitment consistency remained pillars in my head. At the facility, I finally got an MRI that I was previously denied at the hospital, so that's a little victory. On the results, it, the notes read to see rheumatology, possible ankylosing spondylitis. No, that's a mouthful. It took me a couple days to pronounce it correctly, honestly. But after spending a month in a rehab facility, I was released with a wheelchair and walking about 150, 100 to 50 to 100 feet while using forearm crutches, and as well with the diagnosis of spondylitis and psoriatic arthritis. Remember that spinal tap in 2012? It turns out that it activated a dormant gene that triggered my autoimmune disease. So now in October 2018, I had a diagnosis, a plan of care, and was going back to work full time. So all those little victories were now tangible, massive moves and victories had been made. I went back to work for about a week and a half, but my condition got worse. So I had to take a leave of absence. And then I went on long-term disability and moved back to Arizona with my mom so she could be the caregiver that I needed. In November, I had torn the muscles and tendons that connect the hip to the leg bilaterally and strained my iliopsoas muscle, which put me back into a subacute rehab facility. A few days after getting discharged, I vividly remember not being able to eat any food without excruciating pain and throwing up violently. I couldn't sleep. My pain was constantly at an 8 or higher on the pain scale. The sensations of my bones aching as if they were crushed and then remolded with cement. My joints wrecked with a sledgehammer while being stretched on a rack. I couldn't take my meds and I was miserable. I tried to smile through the pain but it hurt so much just to exist. I remember ugly crying to my mom and just saying how I didn't ask for this and I wanted God to take it back because I didn't want to be anybody's testimony. But I could not give up. That was not an option for me. I had lost my three pillars and then I needed to accept and 
adapt and shift my perspective, which was not easy at that time. Honestly, I went through stages of grief and I always returned to denial. It's fine, this is temporary. I'll be out of my wheelchair and I'll be back at work at this date. The biggest shift I had was when I stopped planning for when my health gets better and I decided to just enjoy life in the current state even if I didn't get better, I didn't want to waste my life on what ifs. I chose to accept and adapt my truth. I am a disabled woman. I accepted that for the rest of my life, I will need to rely on mobility aids every once in a while, and I will be subjected to oppressive attitudes toward visible illness the better I get. Fast forward to today. I'm still working to walk on my own. I had another in injury and I've transitioned from being 95% dependent on my wheelchair to now using a rollator. It's a walker with wheels basically. My wheelchair gave me so much independence and freedom and now my rollator gives me so much more. Today I focus on the things I can control with my health. The food I eat, taking time and creating good habits for my mental health, and I remember my three pillars because living with an incurable chronic illness is extremely frustrating and sometimes unpredictable. Okay, all the time it's unpredictable, but you have to be gentle with yourself and control the controllables. So I'm sure you're thinking, oh wow, great story. <laughs> what, how can I relate to this? I don't have an autoimmune disease, I've never used a wheelchair, and I haven't been challenged to that extent. I hear you, but this is how I see it. Every now and then, we fall flat on our face and hope that things will work out in our favor. But as we all know, life does not always work that way. Life has a tendency to hit us hard with a blow that will knock everything you believed out of you and it hurts, there's no doubt about it. But instead of being hard on yourself, remember that everything you encounter is a lesson. Whether that's a triumph, a failure, a person, or a situation, it's up to you to decide what to do next. Sometimes you need to look within yourself and ask, what are you doing wrong? What can you improve on? Are you trying? Are you giving everything 100% at your current task? Ask questions to better yourself and ultimately your future. Accountability and self-reflection are key as we are constant pieces of work. We are not perfect people, but we can always strive to be a better version of ourselves. Take COVID-19, for example. We're in our homes, we've been in our homes for months and out of the protection of not only ourselves, but those within our community. Schools have been virtual, parents and people have lost their jobs. You can't see your friends, you can't go outside. So of course, right now we're all filled with all these emotions. However, instead of looking at this time as a hindrance, try to see it as an opportunity. Use this time to really manifest and start to build the life that you want. What I've been saying this entire time is you need three things. Patience, commitment, consistency to be successful and for you to feel and to succeed in your life. If you have those three things in your core, then it's really hard for you to fail because you won't look at it as, at it as failing. Instead, if you don't get your desired outcome, you don't give up and walk away, you stay committed, you stay consistent in your habits and your behavior. Gives yourself accountability. You have to have patience, especially now in this pandemic, because everything that is happening, the rules, the limitations that are set in place, we have no control over whatsoever. And when we don't have control over things, typically, and when we feel all this built up anxiety and anger and frustrations, it's hard to see to be clear and make clear decisions in life. Being still and patient gives you the opportunity to really look at the things as a whole and not just right now. For example, social media and the way society works with technology, we're used to everything right now. We want the instant gratification, the instant likes, the instant success, but those, thing, those things do not come easy, nor do they happen without hard work. You have to be patient throughout that process. You cannot have commitment without patience, whether that's in a relationship, whether that's in a job, or set, even with setting your own goals. Without commitment, everything can slip through your fingers because when things get hard or even boring, your dedication is truly tested. It's something, 
it's so much easier to just walk away instead of putting in the time, giving it your all, and being committed and being consistent. This is why you must find your why. Because to have a spe specific reason to correlate with your action makes it so much easier to do all three things I've been preaching. These can apply into a multitude of things. For example, you want to get an A on that test. You want a part in the upcoming play. You want a spot on the team. Or even as small as, I don't want to feel like I'm dying when I'm running that dreaded mile. Trust me, I've been there. <laughs> you might be thinking, okay, okay, I get it. Patience, commitment, consistency. But how do I use that in my life when something bad or unexpected happens to me? How am I supposed to focus on the li little victories when I'm so angry I'm so sad and I'm frustrated. My answer is to be still. If something bad happens to you, you have to let yourself feel those emotions and call them out. So we're so often with saying like, okay, this happened and keep moving forward. We're go, 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 go. But you have to feel that emotion and acknowledge those feelings. So when they do come up again, you know how to handle them in the future and appropriately. Let's say you want to try out for track. And you've run before and you're a good runner, but you haven't been running consistently. So unfortunately, you don't make the team. It stings, but you try to understand why. What is the root of this emotion? And afterwards, you realize that you don't even really want to be on the team. You're upset because what you really want is to run a marathon. And this would have been a gateway to train for that. So the next step is you come up with a plan to train. Instead of trying to out for the track team again in the spring. So each day you tell yourself, no matter what, I will walk or jog ten, for 10 minutes. No matter how tired I am, I will make sure I get those 10 minutes in. Every minute is a victory. And then it starts getting easier. So you adjust from a certain amount of minutes to a certain t amount of miles. And then you start to notice after a while that you're getting slower. You're more exhausted and maybe you develop shin splits or even a stress factor fracture. And you wonder, what is the point of all of this? And you feel as if you failed. But instead of looking at this as at the end, shift your perspective and cherish how far you've actually come. Understand that this chapter is not over. It's just bookmark. Now that you know you're going, know that you're going to make mistakes when you're trying to practice patience, commitment, consistency. It's not going to be all sunshines and rainbows. You're going to regress at times, and old habits may service, but that is part of the process. It's not, it has not been easy. I have endured continuous setbacks, especially right now during current quarantine. While you're in, when you're in the hard moments and you want to quit, try to celebrate that you make small habits and small steps forward. Really congratulate and be gentle with yourself. Growth is, and healing is not linear. In the end, understand that creating healthy habits and traits are valuable to have in general. You'll realize that having gratitude, being patient, being a committed person, and having consistency so much rooted in your life, it is so worth it. Don't live your life in spite of things. Accept your moments and cherish your little victories. Grow into the version that you want to desire in the life that you want. So in the beginning, I asked, what does the word legacy mean to you? And how can you focus on legacy when you're being consumed by your present and your past? I personally cannot define what your legacy will be or what legacy means to you. However, I can tell you, instead of being hung up on the big major life achievements you want and what others have, stay focused on your own path and journey. You cannot compare a journey to others because it's not the same as apples and oranges it's not apples to apples don't get caught up on life that you think you should have or that you used to have or the one your past self used to want focus on the life you currently have the life you truly want right now and not what someone else wants for you remember that a few bad things that happen to you and who you are today in this very moment is not who you have to be for the rest of your life I encourage you to really celebrate and cherish the little victories along the way. Because in the end, when you turn around, you'll be surprised at how much you've accomplished. Thank you.